This is Free Thought Radio on Air America. And we're back. I'm Dan Barker here with Annie Laurie Gaylor for Free Thought Radio. And we are very pleased, very privileged to have on the phone today with us, all the way from England, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. And uh, listeners to this show know all about Richard Dawkins. His previous books, which in their own ways were have been blockbusters, The Selfish Gene, and a book that really hit me quite strongly, The Blind Watchmaker, which I read back in the 1980s, which, which crystallized my thinking on evolution and on, on scientific thought. The Devil's Chaplain, and now uh, the international blockbuster, The God Delusion, which uh, the last time we had Professor Dawkins on the phone was, uh, when was it? In the fall of... 06. Fall of 06, before the book came out, so now we're very pleased. Thank you for joining us today, Richard Dawkins. It's a pleasure. So uh, what's it like having uh, an international blockbuster book about atheism? Well, I'm rather gratified that it's one of several, and I'm very um, honored, really, to be th- there with Sam Harris and uh, Dan Dennis and Christopher Hitchens and Victor Stenger, and there are really quite a lot of books that are selling extremely well. Uh, the God Delusion has now sold more than a million and a half copies in English alone. Wow. And it's... Uh, being published in, I think it's now, 32 foreign languages. So I think maybe things are on the move. Well, I have to tell you, last month I was in Brazil to do a conference, an uh, interfaith conference, with a, a good representation of atheists. And two of them brought up Deus un delirio, the God delirium, they call it <laughs> down there. I, I guess they don't have a word for delusion. And they were all excited about it. And do you know about this book, they asked me, and I said, of course I know about this book, it's wonderful. And they had a whole session just on the God Delirium book, so it truly is an international impact. Are you sure it means delirium? I mean, maybe it's one of those words, um, like in, in French, demand, we think it means demand, but actually it means ask. Well, I'll have, could to, be. I'll have to check. Yeah, delirium, I looked it up and it said craziness. And, uh, okay, you know, that's so. all right, That'll, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> Now, you're returning to the United States for a lecture tour in March. Uh, that's correct. And we're going to have the great privilege of having you in Madison, Wisconsin, where our radio show it. originates, March 11th, next week. And um, I read an article in The Guardian, I think it was, saying that you're coming back to this country partly uh, because of all the religion in the presidential race to kind of campaign for reason and atheism and free thought. Is that right? I'm happy to go along with whatever the Guardian (laughs) said. I didn't say that. Uh, But then there's newspapers for you. Um, So I don't know. I mean, yes, I mean, if if they put words into my mouth, I don't object to those words. But how do you feel about uh, what's happening in the United States these days? Well, uh, I I read uh, the the news from time to time. I don't live there, so I'm not, I I don't get it sort of firsthand. But uh, I have noticed that, and people often tell me, that all the presidential candidates uh, have to pay lip service to being religious. They fall over themselves to be holier than thou uh, when they're debating with each other. I think that's very sad, uh, and I'm actually wondering whether they've got it right. I mean, I'm wondering whether perhaps it's all an illusion that you have to be quite as religious as they think they have to be in order to get votes. Well, we think that, of course, there's a growing population of the unaffiliated and the um, unreligious in this country, and that politicians have not caught up with that change in demographic. But uh, when you, I mean, I would like to think that. Do, do you actually? Is that is that a hope, or do you have reason to think that? Yes, the numbers are showing that the non-religious are growing. In fact, yes, the yes. fastest growing segment of the population are either unaffiliated non-religious or or the skeptics, the non-believers. Yes, fourteen well, that's to extremely s- encouraging. So but, maybe we're going to catch up to England someday. Uh, or catch up to the rest of Europe. I would love to know what kind of reaction you get both um, when you're lecturing in the United States, other places, on the God delusion, and also the kind of perhaps um, crank mail you get. Well, I, my crank mail doesn't match up to, to yours, Annie Laurie. Oh. I've actually <laughs> read some of yours. Uh, and um, I've e- even quoted it in, in, the, in the God delusion. That's right. Um, I'm just, I'm a mere amateur as far as getting hate mail well, that's concerned, good, huh? compared to you, um, which, um, well, yeah. Um, but uh, when I'm actually traveling in the United States and giving lectures, 
I seem to get a very friendly reception. And uh, actually, I get a harder time in Europe. I mean, I've had a distinctly harder time in Germany than I did anywhere, I think, in the United States. Um, as, though there are, as though there are people who are religious in Germany who bother to turn up to my talks. Maybe the ones in America just don't turn up. And so the people who do turn up are the people who are already on my side. I remember how surprising it was. I think your first American book tour appearance was in Kansas. And wasn't there just a wonderful reception? From yeah, there was a terrific reception in Kansas. And, uh, and similarly, in I think I did two different places in Virginia, and both of those were wonderful receptions. So, uh, explain, you explain it in the book, but explain to our listeners, why did you use the word delusion? Well, I didn't actually give it all that much thought, to be honest. Uh, it, it just sort of seemed to trip off the tongue rather <laughs> easily. Uh, I think it's a, a false belief. I mean, I think it's a, it's a very big belief, a very important belief, because if, if you believe that there's a, a great spirit that runs the universe then from any point of view, scientific or any other, that's a major belief. And I think it's wrong. I think there's not the slightest evidence for it. I think, therefore, it qualifies for the name delusion. When I was a believer, you know, I used to be a minister. I, I, I knew that. I, um, I actually was, and today I would put it in quotes when I say this, but, but back then I wouldn't. I actually was talking with God having a relationship with Jesus, asking him for advice, following his <laughs> advice, uh -oh. feeling good. You would not have liked me very much back then. And <laughs> I, I think whatever I was doing back then, whatever it was, uh, qualifies as some kind of a mental trickery or delusion or illusion. Well, or Dan, I mean, you're in a very good position to tell the rest of us what it's like, and, and it is actually rather fascinating. You didn't actually hear voices, did you? No, but you know how you can imagine voices? Yes. Well, it was that sort of thing. Uh, uh, I, you, you know, all of us can, might hear voice. Even Carl Sagan said when he was exhausted, when his parents died, he heard his mother's voice. You yeah, know, I've, I've heard voices, too, in the sort of the, the moment when you're just beginning to fall asleep. Something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Silly things like pick up your socks or something. But, but when I was talking to God, it was, it was uh, an imaginary... You know, I thought it was real at the time. I didn't hear a physical baritone. I just... My own yeah. mind was was giving me these ideas, and I sometimes sometimes they said, "Turn right here," and so I turned right there, and then go down to the end of this road, and I did, and then of course nothing happened. It was really stupid, but I thought I was hearing the voice of God. Yeah. <laughs> We're all stunned, Dan. <laughs> uh oh, I'm embarrassing you. <laughs> well, there's millions of people like that, and they really do. And when you talk to these people, you can't just talk them out of this. You just can't shake them out of what they know to be true in their minds because it is so real to them. Yes, I suppose what you can do is show them evidence that uh, really hearing voices is quite common and, and uh, that you know, pe people of different religions will hear different voices. And in Catholic countries, they hear the Virgin Mary and in, in Muslim countries, presumably they hear the voice of Allah. Uh, I mean, I would find that fairly persuasive. If somebody had said that to you, it isn't just an accident that you happened to have been brought up Christian. Mightn't you have thought, oh, yeah, maybe that's right. I thought that we were special and chosen and we had the true faith and all those other people were deluded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But at least you understood that they felt deluded, so that might have opened up your eyes. Yeah, maybe. I, I the can fact, you could be too. I can see the logic now, but back then logic was not that important. Well, uh, logic is an important part of the blockbuster international bestseller, The God Delusion. We are talking with the um, sonorous author of The God Delusion, Professor Richard Dawkins, all the way from England on the phone. And I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor here with Dan Barker. We will be right back to talk more with Richard Dawkins after this break.